Good morning and welcome to our service here at Southside in the parking lot. And like Greg said to those online, uh, thanks for joining us. Ken's in the mountains uh, this weekend for Josh and Tabby's wedding. And so I'll be bringing the word to us this morning. It's good to see everybody. I want to uh, just make a special welcome to my big brother visiting from Texas. I would say you can't miss him because we look alike, but he hides behind this monstrous beard. And so if you can envision me in disguise, you'll recognize my brother. So it's, uh, his name is Chris and his family's here visiting from Texas. Let me pray for our time together. And, uh, and then we're going to open up Acts 14. So if, we, if you want to turn there um, as we pray. Let's pray. God, thank you for our time together this morning as your people that you have redeemed. God, how, how desperately we need you. God, thank you that you have so freely given yourself to us in Christ. And so this morning, I pray as we come that you would bring us into your word by your spirit, that we would come under it humbly, that we would hear it and, and rejoice, we would hear it and repent, we would hear it and be, in, be encouraged in our journey of faith. God, I pray for each person that's here, that's listening. God, would you meet with us this morning? Would you do that business that we so desperately need? God, make us like Christ. Conform us to his image. And God, for those who don't know Christ this morning, I pray that you would open eyes to the glory of Christ in the gospel and that you would give that gift of faith and they would believe and receive the hope of Christ by faith. God, help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today is from Acts 14 and in light of our study in Romans where Paul is expounding the glories of the gospel and unfolding it in all its theological depth and richness, I thought this morning we would take up a simple proclamation of that gospel from the book of Acts for several reasons. One is to simply hear the gospel again, to be encouraged by what God has done for us in Christ through the power of the gospel. We never tire of the message. It's life to us, and it always will be life to us. The lamb that was slain, Christ crucified and resurrected for our forgiveness. Another reason is to see how Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel in a Gentile context. Acts has many proclamations of the gospel. And while the essence of salvation in Christ, by grace, through faith, is consistent throughout every presentation, the gospel is not always preached the same way. To a Jewish audience, the history and the promises of the Old Testament were at the forefront of the message. This is the Messiah God has promised in fulfillment of the Old Testament. Believe in him. You crucified him. Now believe in him. But in Acts 14, in the city of Lystra, which we'll read here in just a minute, and in Acts 17 on Mars Hill in Athens, the gospel is uniquely preached to Gentiles, to non-Jews who had little or no context from the Old Testament, meaning they had a very different starting point. Paganism, mythology, multiple gods, and very different presuppositions. I'm convinced that proclaiming the gospel in a biblically illiterate culture like ours invites us by necessity into these two chapters. Not to limit us, but to educate us and encourage us with how to proclaim the good news of Christ in a secular society. And then finally, I found in Acts as a whole, through the years, a very instructive book regarding the language and ideas that I should think about and communicate in evangelism. Meaning we ought to get our gospel language and gospel ideas from the text. And be very cautious of new and creative or unique ways of preaching the gospel. Acts gives us many presentations of the gospel going out. In synagogues, in town squares, and along roads, in private conversations, and in public preaching. 
And so I would strongly encourage you to mark in your Bible sometime in the future, mark every presentation of the gospel in Acts, and then study them, review them, be encouraged by them, and imitate them. Let these words be the words on your heart and in your mind as you speak of Christ to other people. And so let's read our text. Look with me in Acts chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the, apostle, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. Our context this morning is that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. He has commissioned his disciples to go, to go and make more disciples. And so Luke is documenting for us the history of that going. The preaching and the miracles, the conversions and the controversies. And this morning, we'll look at one presentation of the gospel in the city of Lystra on Paul's first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas Barnabas have been commissioned by the Holy Spirit in Acts 13. The Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have called them. And this was the work that we're reading about. To navigate the different cultures and religions and dangers, and reactions of the people to get the gospel out, to build the New Testament church, and advance the kingdom of God. How? Through preaching, through the proclamation of this message of hope in Christ. So here's the simple overview of our text. Paul is speaking about the Christ In the Gentile city of Lystra, a lame man is healed, and the people respond by attempting to offer worship, to offer sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas because they believe them to be gods. Paul and Barnabas respond rightly by refusing their worship and then clarifying and defending the gospel for them. Look with me in verse 8. I first want us to see a gospel-affirming miracle. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. In the midst of preaching the gospel, Paul sees a man in the crowd. Notice the condition in which he finds this man. There are four descriptions. Verse 8 says the man was sitting. He was sitting because his feet didn't work. That condition in any culture, in any time, would be difficult, but especially difficult in the first century with so little medical advance and advancement and technological advancements. Second, the text says he had no strength in his feet. He had feet, but no power, no energy in those feet. They looked like feet, but they didn't act like feet. They didn't take him where he wanted to go. The text says, thirdly, he was lame from his mother's womb, which tells us the duration of his plight. This was the case for a long time, maybe decades of suffering, maybe long enough to lose hope. But then he hears Paul, and he's confronted with the Christ. Fourthly, it says he had never walked. 
and this description maybe stings the most. He had never done what you and I take for granted every day. What we do without even thinking. He had never walked a step in his entire life. And so he was sitting. It was all he could do. Most likely a beggar whose life was perpetually looking up. A few feet below everyone else. Unable to rise, to walk, to run. To speak to people face to face, standing on his feet. His movement from place to place was based solely on the help of others. No wheelchairs, no electric scooters, no prosthetics. But here is the beauty in this picture. He was sitting, and verse 9 says he was listening. He was listening to Paul speak about the Christ. Verse 9, this man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and began to walk. The joy and the hope in this account is in the quality of the listening. He wasn't merely listening. He was listening. He was hearing with faith. Verse 9 says Paul could see somehow that he had faith to believe, to be healed. Faith in what? Faith in the Christ that Paul was preaching. How could Paul possibly know what was going on in this man's heart? The text doesn't say. Paul fixed his gaze on him. He stared right at him. He locked eyes with him. And either by something in the man's appearance, his face indicated agreement maybe, or the Holy Spirit somehow revealed to Paul that this man was believing the message, somehow Paul knew. He knew that the listening was effectual. It was from the heart. That's the best kind of listening. Remember when you and I were listening before we were saved. But we weren't really listening. Sound waves were traveling down into our ears and vibrating eardrums, but we weren't listening. When God saves a person, when God calls a person to himself, he first enables them to listen, to really listen. Listen like our lives depend on hearing this message. Don't, don't hear this the wrong way, but I work with the teenagers in our church, right? Right? And in those years, 12 to 18 years old, listening is a precious and rare commodity. I've watched teenagers at times sleep from the moment I open the Bible to the closing prayer. Almost on cue, open your Bibles. Amen. They're awake. Don't ask me if it was your child. I protect the guilty. I've seen youth play Candy Crush on their phone while we talk about eternity and judgment. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay with all of it because listening is a gift. It doesn't mean we shouldn't press people to do it. I ask the youth to listen to the word, and by far most of them do. But listening is from God. Listening is from God by His Spirit. I've also seen kids sleep through their entire middle school and high school experience in this church and then go away to college and then listen for the first time and be altogether born again and come back to our church a completely new person in Christ. I watch most of your kids open their Bibles whenever the Bible is taught and listen intently because God in his mercy has given so many of them faith to listen. They love to listen. They live to listen to Christ. I remember hearing the gospel every Sunday as a kid growing up in a church and being completely enthralled with everything and anything but the gospel. And then one day, I was listening. And it was as if time stood still and it was like the preacher had fixed his gaze on me And suddenly what didn't matter before now mattered preeminently. My soul mattered. My sin mattered. Life and death mattered. Eternity mattered. God's judgment mattered. And above all else, 
Christ mattered like never before. He was worth hearing about. He was worth listening to. He was worth forsaking all else to have and to believe in. And so don't give up if your coworker or your kids or your spouse or your unbelieving friend isn't listening. Keep praying, keep proclaiming until that day when God hopefully draws them to himself. And for the first time, they're really listening. Are you listening this morning? Does your heart want what your heart needs? Do you want Christ this morning? Are you fed up with all the years that you've listened but not really listened? Listened but not believed? And so would you, like this lame man, listen for the first time this morning as we hear the account of the gospel from the apostles in Acts 14? Paul fixed his gaze on this man and in a loud voice commanded him, stand upright on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk with great surprise and great joy, I'm sure. How did he, how did he do this? I don't know. God did it. It violated every principle of science and medicine, but he did it. And this man walked. Why did he do it? To testify to the gospel. God displays his power through miracles to both love the individual person suffering and also to confirm the gospel message that Christ is the Messiah, that what Paul and Barnabas are claiming in Lystra is utterly true and from God. This man listened and believed and he was healed. Second, I want us to see in this text a pagan response to a gospel miracle. Verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. This is the hard-heartedness of sin. A man is miraculously healed in the name of Christ by the power of the living God. And the crowd does anything but yield to the gospel. They, they merely incorporate the miracle into their own religious beliefs. They steal the miracle. They say the gods have become like men and come down to us. And before we rightly reject this outcry by the crowd, I want us to notice something re I think really important about the crowd. This universal desire to be visited by someone greater than ourselves from out there. The hope that someone out there would come here and help us and deliver us. It's a universal hope because the world is broken. You and I are broken. And as soon as the people witness the miracle, they immediately claim this is it. The gods have come. And whether it's mythological gods or alien encounters, oh, how we want to be visited. You and I want to be delivered to encounter God in some profound way. The, the sad irony is the very thing we so desperately want and need. Visitation from God has already happened and we missed it. We rejected him. How many more virgin-born, miracle-working, prophecy-fulfilling, resurrected messiahs are we waiting for before we will believe? If you're still looking to the heavens for visitation today, can I encourage you, can I beg you to stop looking and start believing the good news that Christ has come? And salvation is freely offered to anyone who will look to him by faith. 1 Timothy 1.15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. If you fully accept that today by faith, like Paul just said, then today will be your day of visitation. But the crowd redefines the miracle. 
And by redefining it, they reject the miracle. It wasn't up for grabs where the miracle originated. This wasn't their miracle to steal. There's more context to this sudden outcry of the crowd, though. The tradition, the folklore of Lystra was that the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes had previously visited Lystra in disguise. And no one welcomed them except a peasant named Philemon and his wife Baucis. So in anger, the gods drowned everyone in a flood except these two. And the people were desperately afraid that this might happen again. So the priest of Zeus takes the lead and he initiates an offering of oxen and sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas to stay off maybe a second wave of punishment. Paul and Barnabas will have none of it. And they respond quickly and they reject this attempt. So let's consider their response in verses 14 to 17. I want us to see thirdly a clear defense of the gospel. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Paul and Barnabas respond in three ways. First, they tear their clothes. They rip their robes. It's a sign of utter disdain and rejection of this blasphemy. Why are you doing these things? Second, they rush into the crowd. They dive right into the middle of this frenzied worship riot to make it stop. And they address the crowd in defense of the message of Christ that they've been preaching. Their first defense is this. We are also men of the same nature as you and therefore completely unworthy of worship. Created beings worship the creator and not vice versa. Man is never worthy of worship. In Hollywood, in sports, in politics, we are all men and women of the same nature, and that nature is both creaturely and sinful. Worship is reserved for God and God alone. And here's where they start taking back the narrative. Paul and Barnabas say, we aren't Zeus and Hermes. We are men who preach the gospel to you. And here's the simple gospel in this text. Don't assimilate this miracle into your mythology. Turn from your mythology. Turn from these vain things to a living God. It's so clear. It's so pointed the way they address the crowd. In that sweeping statement, they draw a line between all other religions and the gospel they're preaching. Think about what they're saying to this crowd. All of what you are doing, all of your gods, all of your hopes and dreams in these gods, your sacrifices and your garlands, your temples to Zeus, it's all pointless. It's vain. It's all for naught. It's all dead and you should turn from it. Repent. Talk about cultural insensitivity. Talk about shooting straight on really sensitive issues. They didn't entertain any of it for even a second. But with passion, they call out the entire crowd. It's all dead. It doesn't work. It won't save you. You won't find God or forgiveness. You won't find eternal life in this. That is the certainty of the gospel, and it is the way it should be preached with great love, with great compassion, but without backing away from the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. There is only one God, and he alone is alive. And he alone can save. And to the degree that we recoil from such a clear statement about other, all other religions as being utterly futile and dead and vain, I think we reveal what we really believe about Christ. D.A. Carson said of evangelism in a postmodern world that salvation is not so much revealed in what a person believes, but in what they reject. To come to Christ is to reject all other gods and all other religions as dead, unequivocally vain, and without hope. That is salvation. Not assimilating Christ into some other worldview. 
It's a marriage in which we forsake all others to have this Christ and this Christ alone. To have this one treasure. And all else is loss and Christ alone is gain. This should encourage us. It, it should convict us. This is how the apostles preached the gospel. Gospel. It wasn't relational evangelism. It wasn't cultural accommodation or religious assimilation of any kind. It was a clear line in the sand motivated by love for God and love for these people. Stop worshiping us. Stop worshiping your dead religion and turn to the living God. They go on defining this living God as the one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Paul and Barnabas present the gospel to these crowds, surprisingly maybe to some, from a foundation of creation, a starting point of Genesis 1. It is the very evidence that God is alive. The living God creates living things. He alone is the power and the source, exactly what Paul is doing in Acts 17. Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Would you preach the gospel in our culture from a premise of creation? with all the controversy surrounding creation, a starting point of a creator God. I think the biblical precedent is firmly as established in the text. How can we not? How can we not start there? Regardless of the response, even though you and I might be perceived as the worst kind of country bumpkin, fundamentalist, Bible-believing, hillbilly fool, Tell people about creation. A living creator God who made everything by simply speaking it into existence. What a simple gospel message. Turn from these vain things to a living God. Turn to God in Christ. Look at verse 16. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. The coming of the gospel marked a paradigm shift in redemptive history. God was building toward it through promises and covenants. But until the gospel would be proclaimed to all the nations, Paul and Barnabas explained what God was doing with all the nations. Here's what I want us to see. All the nations went astray. They followed after their own lusts and desires and fell into disarray and debauchery and utter godlessness. They wandered. And in the past, just as in our present, all of it, without exception, was by permission. Think about that. Let that comfort your heart this morning. Nations go astray. But they never go astray apart from God's sovereign permission. Sin and Satan are never winning. Nations only go where God permits them. And his permission is for a reason. It's toward a goal. He's doing something that we can't see. Everything is still moving perfectly toward the summing up of all things in Christ. Can you watch the news and believe that? Can you watch the news in our culture and find peace in the God who gives permission for nations to go astray? We might not understand it. We might, we might not like, like to watch it at all, to watch a nation go astray. But never excuse God from it. Never challenge the wisdom or perfection of his decree. Because in heaven, we will see it so perfectly. We'll get it. How God orchestrated his plan for the glory of his name and the exaltation of his son. And so, instead of fear, worship the God who gives permission to the nations. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 115 and Psalm 135. And my heart needs that daily. Daily. 
in this crazy world. Look in verse 17. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Finally, I want us to see within their defense of the gospel, this fourfold witness of God to himself while the nations go astray. The text says, and yet, but wait, God wasn't silent before the cross. He didn't leave himself without testimony, without witness. And so let's start with just that idea that God is a witnessing God. What a thought. He desires in his perfection to communicate himself to us. While we are his enemies, we are rebels against him in our fallen sinful state. Why would he do that? Not because he's lonely, not because he needs us in any way, not because he has to, but because he wants to. It is his glory to witness to himself. It is inherent and right and good for God to reveal himself. Such beauty, such perfection, he must be witness to. So what is this witness? What has he been telling us before the cross? And what is he still telling us even after the cross? The fourfold witness, the first is this. His first witness is that he is good to us. Verse 17, in that he did good. In the generations past, nations were going astray, but God has been communicating quite loudly to us. And his testimony to the nations is to his goodness. And that goodness was and is personally experienced by every person. The text says, in that he did good and gave to you, put yourself in the you. His witness wasn't one of wrath. It could have been. He could witness to any of his attributes, but his witness to us is goodness. Why would God choose goodness as a witness? Because that is the general category he wants us to know about him, to work from. He wants that to be our presupposition in our experience, in hearing the gospel. The gospel begins in creation and God's goodness. It suits us well, doesn't it? God made you and God is good. I'm listening now. That's exactly what we need to know first off from him and about him. Two things every science fiction movie addresses in the alien encounter. Number one, that the aliens have come. And number two, are they good? Or will they eat us or conquer us? Why has is, why is God been good to us? For this one purpose, that we might stop going astray with the nations and turn and trust the living God and believe the gospel. That has always been the point of the witness. That is why Paul and Barnabas are emphasizing the goodness of God to the crowd in Lystra. God's goodness is always gospel witness. God's goodness points us, it brings us to repentance, Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But how has God been good? Our second witness in the text is this. He provides physically for you. He gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons. And before we rise up and we declare that we alone provide for ourselves by working hard, buying our food at the grocery store, paying our way through life, listen to what Paul and Barnabas are actually saying. They are addressing God's goodness in the ultimate source of provision rains and fruitful seasons. If it stopped raining on our planet and nothing grew, we'd die pretty quick. So that even if there are 50 steps between food growth and food processing and food distribution to our homes and ultimately into your mouth, God is behind all of it. God makes it rain and causes the earth to bear fruit. And God is ultimately the one who has fed you all your life. Consider that goodness. You love your mother for feeding you when you were helpless. What about humbly admitting that God has fed me all my days? God did it. 
and it was undeniable goodness to me. Every time it rains, every change of the seasons, the very produce section at Costco, every meal on the table, thank God for his goodness and repent and believe the gospel. The third facet of this fourfold witness of God is this. Number three, he satisfies our hearts with food. Paul and Barnabas don't stop at just food provision and sustenance. They press us to acknowledge the very essence of who we are. Image-bearing joy seekers. Made in God's image, we desire good things that bring us joy. It's not just rain and food and a full belly. It's the full experience that God gives us in it. He satisfies or fills our hearts with food. Now, obviously, food doesn't go into our hearts. That's not the point. But what is our experience with food in our hearts? Where does that come from? Is there a better picture of satisfaction and contentment than a baby that's just been fed? Resting peacefully. Or a house full of sleepy family members watching football on Thanksgiving afternoon. Because why? Because their hearts have been satisfied with food. Good food and lots of it. Who provided the food? Who provided the satisfaction in the heart? Who provided the taste buds, the mental and emotional capacity to experience the joy of that food? Who is the author of the entire scenario? God is. Listen, God could have made us eat brown goo in isolation for 90 years and then die. But he didn't. And I don't even want to try to begin to describe the joy of food because I believe we're all foodies at heart. Because the diversity and the tastiness of God's creation is irrefutable. We all love food and there's a lot to love colors and tastes and smells and textures and I know I'm sure your experience is like this sometimes I will eat something and I'm utterly shocked wow that I've never tasted something like that before that is utterly amazing and my heart is satisfied in that food and it's not just thanksgiving It's 1,095 meals a year and all the snacks in between. Every bite of food that enters your mouth, that satisfies your heart, it's all from God. And if you're willing to hear it this morning, it's all about the gospel. Wait, what? What does enjoying my Chick-fil-A nuggets have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Absolutely everything, all the time, without exception. God made everything. It was very good. And he provides you and me through the rain and the seasons with food so we can live a good thing. And then that food satisfies our hearts and we enjoy it. Yet another witness to his goodness. But that's not the chief end of food. He doesn't feed us in a vacuum. That food, every bite of it, it testifies like a laser pointer to the God who supplied it. And whether we receive it with thanksgiving as worship because we have a relationship with him by faith or every bite testifies against you that you're a rebel and you're a thief and every meal cries out against you in your sin because you receive God's goodness every day but you will not bow the knee to him and believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Why? Because eating and drinking is either worship or it's rebellion. And where you stand with Christ tips the scales one way or the other. So think about your eating and your joy in eating and where you stand with God. That is the argument that Paul is making and Barnabas is making. And then finally, the fourth witness of God to the nations while they go astray is this. He satisfies our heart with gladness. The text says God 
fills our heart with gladness, with joy, with good things that are from him and to us. And that has been his witness all of your life. I love a good plot twist in a story. And this is a radical plot twist in a person's life. Think about someone who lives their life with no biblical knowledge of God. They simply come into this world in in sin and sinning, speculating about God and about truth, maybe denying his existence, maybe bitter against him because because life hasn't turned out the way that they thought it would turn out, which it never does. And then one day, while wandering through the market in downtown Lystra, that person Here's two guys talking about God and Jesus and this gospel. And they make this statement. He has not left you without witness. He's done good to you and has satisfied your heart with gladness. And if you're listening, if you're really listening, that is an unprecedented statement. Wait, what? Are you saying that every moment of my life that my heart was glad when I caught a glimpse of goodness, of joy, and someone loved me, or a baby smiled at me, or a meal was good, or I laughed until I cried, or I got a birthday present, or witnessed the sunset, or felt sand between my toes. Every joy in my heart I've ever experienced It was all from him? It was all from God? That is not how I have understood this God. And there's a spiritual crisis in that moment. Wait, I don't even believe he exists. But deep down, that I just know that 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 goodness has a source. That joy comes from somewhere. It comes from someone. Maybe you've wrestled with the idea of this God and frankly, you've come to hate him. But it's tough to hate someone who has been so good to you. Two amazing implications from this statement. The first is this. The one who satisfies your heart with gladness must first himself be satisfied with gladness in his own heart. That is both a rational and a biblical conclusion. You cannot give what you don't have. And so we must continually, believer, unbeliever, we must reckon with the joy of God, the gladness and contentment within the Trinity. God is perfectly, he's perpetually and wonderfully satisfied in himself. And we can't, can't even begin to imagine how full of joy our God is. No one is more joyful than God. It's simply who he is. His joy is holy It's unchanging. It's perfectly wise. It's an all-knowing joy. It's an all-powerful joy. It's eternally deep and infinitely wide. Nothing diminishes his joy or steals his joy from him. He's not insecure in his joy. He needs nothing outside himself to bring him joy. He will never lose the intensity of his joy. He doesn't have good days and bad days. He can't be any more joyful than he is because he is perfectly joyful in himself always. He is and always will be what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 11, the blessed God. And his joy overflows into his creation both in our experiences of joy and preeminently in and through the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the good news of the happy God. The gospel is the only path to ultimate joy because it is the only path to him. Psalm 16, 11, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. And every hint of joy in your life, all of it is from his hand to you to bring you to himself. The second implication of this God-given gladness is this. The one who satisfies my heart with gladness, if I'm willing to accept this, must be in some sense, in some way, for me. And he is. To believe the gospel is to believe God is for me in Christ. 
that the shed blood of Christ was for my benefit and my good and my eternal joy in him. Not just in his general goodness and provision and the joy he gives. Believing those things won't save you. But these lesser joys, God's temporal goodness, they point us to the greatest good, the greatest joy, the very cross event and the gospel. The fourfold witness of God in Acts 14 is not the final witness to God's goodness. That they're a motivation to consider his greatest good in Christ. God's goodness is like a trail of breadcrumbs that leads us to the very foot of the cross. So what do we do with all this goodness this morning? If you don't know God, then come to Christ right now. Flee to Christ this very moment. And he will save you, but you have to come now. Because his temporal goodness is not forever. And there will be a day where you will be judged and you must give an account for what you did with the gospel and with all the goodness that pointed you to it. And so don't wait to believe in Christ. Believers, what are we to do with all this goodness in creation, in provision, in our salvation, our joy in Christ, what can we do but receive it humbly, be thankful for all of it, and enjoy Him. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always acknowledge the giver over the gift and in the gift. Share the goodness of God freely. Help people see the breadcrumbs that lead them to the cross. And finally, prepare yourself for more of his goodness in heaven. More of his joy. We will one day see him face to face and without the restraint of sin, we will receive of his infinite goodness and joy forever. There is so much more to come. Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness to us and every detail of our life. When we were helpless as a baby, every day that the sun comes up and the rains come down and food grows up from the earth and you feed us out of your goodness, God, thank you for your goodness to us in Christ. Ultimate goodness in laying down your life, that we might go free, that we might know the joy of trusting in Christ, the fullness of joy, pleasures forever. God, help us to live in that. Help us to, in light of all of your goodness, respond with a life that is worthy of this gospel. God, help us to do that by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.